Okay, according to my clock, it's 2.30, so I guess I'll start. Um, so yesterday, I began by discussing aggregation kinetics, and we solved in complete detail the uh, constant kernel system. And then I introduced the product kernel system, which is a very simple model for real gelation, in which clusters of size i have basically i uh, sort of grabby arms on their surface. And so when two clusters of size i and j meet, the rate at which the reactor is proportional to the product of the concentrations times I times J. And uh, what I did yesterday, I went like a bulldozer and I solved these rate equations using the generating function technique and we got to the final solution, but we didn't interpret anything. So what I want to do today is be a little bit slower and interpret the solution that we got from this and look at what are the physical consequences. Because this is actually a very beautiful system because there is a phase transition at a finite time where an infinite gel molecule appears. And we don't see it yet just from the exact solution without a little bit of work. So just let me remind you some of the steps from last time. So the way that we solve this is that we introduce the generating function E Y T. And I write capital E to denote exponential generating function. So this is a summation k equals 1 to infinity, k c k e to the y k. And putting the k in front, uh, it was a matter of convenience. And if you try it without this k in front, this generating function without the k in front, you will again, you can carry everything through to the end. And you'll see like at the very last step, you'll say, geez, it would have been a lot easier if I put a k in front here, and then you will do it. So anyways, that was the exponential generating function. And then you had a, the solution was uh, look like this. Um, e, e to the minus ET was equal to E to the, uh, I guess it's Y minus T. Um, so it's an implicit solution. And what I showed last time was that the way that you actually invert this and solve for E directly is in terms of this beautiful thing called the Lagrange inversion formula. And Again, it's one of these things that when you first see it, it looks like black magic, but it's just, it's part of the black magic of residue calculus. You can do amazing things with, um, with these sorts of uh, contra-integration techniques. And so um, what we end up from this is that we found that CK is equal to K, K to the power K minus two over uh, K factorial uh, t to the power k minus 1, e to the minus kt. So I guess that's where I ended up last time. And so what I want to do now is like start looking at the asymptotic behavior of this function and understand a little bit more physically what's going on. So um, how do we do something with this? We'll apply Stirling's approximation. So in the limit of large k, we'll write k factorial in Stirling's form. So this is k to the power k minus 2. And then here I have k over e to the power k times square root of 2 pi k. So that's the k factorial. And I'll have, I'll write here e to the minus k t. And now um, allow me in the limit of large k, I'll just replace k minus 1 by k and I put this in the exponential. So I'm going to have uh, minus k log t. I'm sorry, the k is already absorbed in front, so minus log t. All right. So uh, these are all straightforward steps, and I won't like belabor some of them unless someone has a question. But uh, notice that uh, k powers of k are canceled here. I have two powers, another one half power. So there's a one over the square root of two pi, uh, k to the power of five halves. Then there's an e to the minus k, which I'll put here, and I have e to the minus k, t minus log t. This is e to the minus k. Uh, oh, it's e, this is e to the, this is, yes, yeah, so when I put it up here, it's e to the plus k, so here it's minus 1. So that's what it looks like. Um, it's still not revealing what's going on here, and so to reveal what's going on, let's look, and uh, so I guess the point is that you see that this is exponential decay with a characteristic size scale, which is 1 over this thing. And now if you look at what this does as a function of t, you'll find that as t goes to 1, so as you see when t is equal to 1, t log 1 is 0, t minus 1 is 0, so that goes to 0, which means there's actually a singularity happening in the, in the function here. And to reveal it, let's now look at, uh, take t is equal to 1 minus epsilon. 
And if we substitute in here, so we'll have 1 minus epsilon minus log t, which will be um, uh, minus, and so there'll be minus epsilon minus epsilon squared over 2, and then I have minus 1. So this is to lowest order, so the 1's cancel, the linear term cancels, and what I get out of all of this is 1 over the square root of 2 pi, k to the power 5 halves, e to the minus k, epsilon squared over 2, which I'll then write back in terms of t. So it's t, one, I mean it's k, 1 minus t squared over 2. And if I define this thing to be k divided by k star, then I infer that there's a characteristic size scale, or mass scale, which is 2 divided by, and the exponent is outside the brackets, not inside the brackets, 2 over 1 minus t squared. So what we find then is that for t less than 1, ck decays exponentially. Exponentially in k. And for t equals 1, ck is proportional to k to the minus 5 halves. So it changes from an exponential distribution to a power law distribution, which says that if I look at then moments of this size distribution, they will blow up at t equals 1. And so this is the evidence that there exists some kind of a transition at t equals 1. Now, you know, we pulled out heavy machinery to start with this equation and arrive at the solution. But there's a simpler way to get some feeling for what's going on by looking again at the moments. So when I was studying constant kernel aggregation, I first um, computed the moments before solving the equation. Here I did it backwards, I actually solved everything. Uh, and, but now I want to go back and look at the moments of the distribution because they're revealing in, in what they show. And we'll see one of the outcomes of this is we'll have a very simple equation for the gel fraction as a function of time. So again, remember that the moments were defined as m sub n was equal to summation k to the n ck. So let's be naive for the moment, and let's take this equation for the definition of moments at face value. We're going to see that, in fact, there is um, a little glitch in there, but we'll, we'll deal with it mo when we come to the problem. And let's now look at the equations for the low-order moment. So let's look at m0 dot. So we want to compute the zeroth moment. We take this equation, sum over all k, and over here, what do we have? So when we sum over all k, it makes an unrestricted sum. So I have ICI, JCJ. ICI is just the first moment. JCJ is just the first moment. So I have um, one half the first moment squared. And then the second term is just the sum KCK, which is just the first moment squared. I mean, just the first moment. Now, let me keep the sort of naive assumption that the mass is conserved. We'd like to think the mass is conserved. I, I spent a lot of time discussing it in the case of constant, uh, constant kernel aggregation. So if the mass is conserved and I can choose my unit such that the mass is 1, so this just goes over into minus 1 half. And this tells me that m0 goes like 1 minus t over 2. The initial condition, again, the monomer-only initial condition means that the zeroth moment is 1 at t equals 0, and it decays linearly. This suggests that when t reaches 2, something bizarre happens because the number of clusters goes negative. So let me put an exclamation point or two here because it's a sign that there's something funky going on in the system. So here is actually the first evidence that, with not very much work, that um, uh, there's something weird going on as time goes on. Uh, let's look at the first moment, so m1 dot. So I take my equation, multiply through by k, and sum. So the second term is easy because that's going to be just m2. The first term I have k, which is i plus j, and then I have a term which is, um, so I have i plus j, and so there'll be a term which is i squared j, which is m2, m1, and then another term which is j squared i, which is m2, m1. There's two of them that cancels this guy. And so I have um, m2, m1, minus m2. And so if the mass is conserved, you know, if m1 is equal to 1, then this is just equal to 0, if m1 is equal to 1. 
Next equation is the second moment, and this is perhaps the more, most crucial one because this shows the a clear evidence of a singularity. So let's look at the second moment. So we take our master equations, multiply through now by k squared. So here we have the third moment. Here when I multiply by i plus j squared, so there's terms that look like i squared times i, so that's i cubed times jcj, so that's m3, m1. There's two identical such terms which cancels one half. And then there's a cross term here, i squared, j squared. Um, I'm sorry, yeah, it's, it's i, I'm sorry, it's 2ij, the 2 cancels the 2 here. And then I have ij times ij, so it's m2 squared. So when I put this all together, I have um, a term that looks like m3, uh, m3, m1 plus m2 squared minus m3. And so this just goes to m2 squared. And the solution to the equation m2 dot is m2 squared is nothing more than m2 is equal to 1 divided by 1 minus t. So this is showing that there is a transition at t equals 1, which we found from the exact solution, where the second moment of the cluster size distribution blows up. Question for the um, uh, tutorial period. Here is a characteristic size scale, 1 over 1 minus t. Here is a characteristic size scale, 1 over 1 minus t squared. Why are they different? So something to think about. OK. So um, the fact that this blows up suggests to us that this naive picture of how we're writing the moments is actually a little bit incomplete. Because if you think about percolation, which I'm hoping that all of you have at least seen in some sense, you know that at the percolation threshold, an infinite cluster appears, which is kind of separate from all the finite clusters. And so if you're trying to do a summation over all the cluster size distribution, there's one term at infinity, which is kind of separated from all of this. So if we want to do the moments more carefully, we have to keep track of the fact that there's one cluster, which is macroscopic in size. So let's look at the moments more carefully. So what I'm going to do is I'll write that m sub n is equal to two types of terms. There's k n c sub n, where the sum goes uh, you know, to infinity. But the point is that there's one term that is like way beyond the upper limit of the sum, the macroscopic cluster. So there'll be one more term plus k n c n. And so I'll write this as the gel. And I'll write this sum as the sol. So I'm using the terminology from chemistry. You call the finite clusters the sol and the infinite cluster the gel. Now, we see that the second, because of the divergence of the second moment, we believe now that there ought to exist an infinite cluster. You know, again, we're thinking about the limit of a finite size system uh, and the limit where the system size goes to infinity. So this gel, so the gel, so what would I say is that the size of the gel gel size is equal to uh, G times script M. So here I'm now thinking about specifically dealing with a finite system. So I put capital script M monomers in a large box. And when a gel appears, the size of the gel will be a finite fraction. So this G is called the gel fraction. Can you not see this? Everyone can see these words here? Pardon me? Say that again. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Thank you. I make, yeah, CK here. CK. Thank you. I'm sorry about that. Okay, so the gel fraction. Um, And so this is, you know, g is some finite number that's between 0 and 1. So when it's equal to 0, we don't have any gel. When it's a finite number, then we do have a gel. But if we have one molecule that's macroscopic in size, and now this requires a lot more um, mathematical proof, but the point is that the number of these gel molecules is actually 1. It's not 17, it's not 34, it's 1 as the size of the system goes to infinity. So the gel concentration
will be equal to 1 divided by m, because there's one such gel molecule in the system. So in this case, if I now look at the moments with this um, sort of decomposition, there's going to be the summation KNCK sol, and then there's going to be the size to the nth power, which is G m to the power n, and then the concentration is, is 1 over m. So let's use this to now reconsider our moments and what they actually mean. So the zeroth moment is nothing more than some k, c, k, I'm sorry, zeroth moment is just c, k, sol, and if n is equal to zero, this goes away plus one over m. I can forget about this because in the limit of large m, it goes away. So the definition of the zeroth moment is sort of insensitive to whether there's a gelation transition or not. But the first moment and higher moments are sensitive to this, so let's look at this first moment. So it's summation k, c, k, sol. And then I have n equals 1, so I have g, m over m plus g. So now comes a reinterpretation of this equation, which is that by construction, the summation over all clusters, finite and infinite, is the total mass in the system, which is definitely conserved. So instead of writing this as m1, I'm going to write this as 1. And I will write this sum over all finite clusters as m1. So it looks like I'm sort of doing some sleight of hand, and in fact I am, but it's the correct interpretation of these equations. So from this, we get that um, g is equal to 1 minus m1. So very important equation. It looks very trivial, but it turns out to be very important. So the point is that when the sol phase is everybody, then there's no gel, but when the sol phase is not everybody, then what's left over goes into the gel phase. And let me do one more equation, so m2, so this is equal to summation kck squared sol. And for n equals 2, I'll have g squared m squared over m. So this is plus g squared m. And now for this equation, in the limit as m goes to infinity, we can forget about this guy. So the point is that once you have the gel, everything is dominated by the one term in the sum that corresponds to the gel molecule. So now we can fix this problem here that we saw because we should use the right interpretation of the first moment. So now we find, uh, so, so let's reconsider the, you know, so let's reconsider m0 dot. So it's equal to 1 half, and so it's equal to 1 minus g squared minus uh, 1 minus g. So if g is equal to 0, we just get the same result as before. But when g is non-zero, so let, let me just write it out. So there is uh, minus 1 half. There's a minus 2g, which can't, and that, that 1 half, and this cancels, so there's no um, linear term. And then I have uh, uh, g squared. So what I get here is uh, g squared minus 1 over 2. So notice that when the gel fraction is 0, so what we find from this is that m0 has the following behavior. It's 1 minus t over 2 for t less than 1. Because for t less than 1, the gel fraction is equal to 0. But for t bigger than 1, the gel fraction appears, and so the rate at which m0 decreases goes down. And in fact, when g approaches 1, when everything becomes part of the gel, the decrease of m0 goes to 0. And so in fact, this thing goes to 0 exponentially in t. This is not anything I'm going to show because it's more detailed analysis, but at least it resolves this apparent uh, craziness uh, beyond t equals uh, 2 in the uh, naive equations. Okay, very last thing that I want to show is I want to now derive a simple equation for how the gel fraction actually appears. And to do this, I'm going to go back to my generating function solution. So now let's, let's compute the solution for, for g. So g was equal to 1 minus m1. 
But what is 1 minus m1? That's equal to 1 minus. And if you look over on the left panel, you see that e, the generating function, if I set y equals 0, is just the first moment. So this is nothing more than 1 minus e at y equals 0. Or e of y equals 0 is equal to 1 minus g. So what I can do then is take my solution for the generating function and plug in 1 minus g and see what comes out. So I can barely see it, but what I get then, so I substitute in, and I get 1 minus g, then I have e to the uh, minus, so it's minus 1 minus g t is equal to, so when y is equal to 0, so it's e to the minus t. And so let's solve this equation. So first of all, the e to the minus t cancels that guy. And then I have the equation g is equal to 1 minus e to the minus gt. So this is a very simple, innocuous looking equation, but it has the same flavor as the mean field solution of the Ising model. You know, in the Ising model, the mean field, you say that the magnetization is hyperbolic tangent of, of m over kt, I'm sorry, mh over kt, and then there's a phase transition when j over kt is equal to 1. Uh, similar here, if we, you know, we can't solve this equation exactly because it's a transcendental equation, but we can plot it. So let me plot, um, you know, the left-hand side. So the left-hand side is a function of g is just this. So that's g. What is the right-hand side? So when uh, g goes to 0, we can expand this linearly, and the first term is gt. So the slope of the function at the origin is gt, and so there's two possible behaviors. For t less than 1, it looks something like this. So this is t less than 1. The only solution is no gel. But for t bigger than 1, the slope is b bigger than 1 initially, but it has to saturate because it has to asymptote to 1. And there's another solution here, you know, the gel fraction. So um, this is uh, a simple way of showing that there is the appearance of a gel molecule in, the co in this product kernel aggregation. So um, that brings me to the end of the product kernel aggregation. Again, um, you know, I realized that to go from here to here was kind of, and then to here was kind of mathematically a little bit advanced. So please, you know, pester me with questions um, when we do the tutorial later today. So any questions before I continue on? Yeah. Well, again, it, depend, it should be conserved, but then you have to interpret the first moment properly. And so the first moment has to include the sum over the sol molecules and the gel molecule. Um, and in going to this, it turns out to be convenient to redefine M1 as the difference between you know, everything and the gel molecule. So when you, when you're correct that this M1 has to always be conserved, and it is always conserved, but you just have to interpret it properly. Yes? Oh, that's, that's actually a state-of-the-art calculation, and it's beyond anything that I know how to do. But, I mean, very powerful mathematicians have proved that there's only one. Um, one thing I just want to mention is that in the last lecture I'm going to give on Friday, we are going to discuss something called the Erdos-Renyi random graph. And in fact, I've already solved it. Everything about the Erdos-Renyi random graph is hidden inside a product kernel aggregation. So just keep that in mind because sometimes it's nice to see these connections between different fields of physics that you never would have imagined in the first place. So product kernel aggregation is actually nothing more than the Erdos-Renyi random graph. Okay, so I have one more topic in the field of um, aggregation that I want to discuss, and that is a steady state aggregation. So this is now thinking more like an industrial process. You have a large you know, factory, you feed in chemicals at one side, you put them in a big vat, you do some mixing and some chemical reaction, and out comes like some product uh, that is some kind of, as a result of some kind of aggregation reaction. And uh, so maybe I, maybe I should call it aggregation with input. Maybe that's a better way of putting it.
So what I have in mind here is the following scenario. So here is my cluster mass distribution. Here is K. Here is C sub K. And what I'm doing is I'm feeding in, say, monomers. So monomers are being continuously fed in. So here is one. I'm feeding in monomers. So here is the feed in. And then the system just freely aggregates, aggregates, and there'll be some kind of a cluster mass distribution. Maybe I should plot log CK versus log K, so power law will look like a straight line. And, you know, there'll be some shoulder here because, you know, uh, if I feed in for one hour, there's a certain upper limit to the size of the clusters. But below this upper limit, they will go, we will have a steady state mass distribution. And what I want to ask is, what is this steady state mass distribution? So CK... Um, at t equals infinity equals question mark. And part of the reason I'm showing this example is that, again, as I mentioned, this sort of unexpected uh, unity between different fields of physics is that this actually is the same picture that one invokes in trying to understand homogeneous turbulence. So, um, you know, if you are rowing in a rowboat and you put the paddle in the water and you make a big, like, vortex, and if you stare at it, you'll see that the vortex, because of the nonlinearities of the Navier-Stokes equation, the vortex breaks up into smaller vortices, it breaks up into smaller vortices, it goes on and on until you reach the inertial scale where viscosity dominates and damps everything out. And so, in fact, the energy spectrum in homogeneous turbulence looks qualitatively just like this. So, just as an amusing sidelight here, if I plot as a function of k, the energy density as a function of k, log e k versus log k, one finds that there exists a so-called inertial range. So, you know, there's a, if this is now a wave number, not, it doesn't refer to mass. So here, this refers to like one over the length scale. So you're feeding it a small wave number, which is a large length scale, and then there's an energy cascade, and at least in the original mean field theory of homogeneous turbulence, this scale is k to the minus five-thirds. And by the way, if you've not done this exercise for yourself, I highly, I really recommend it. Take a bottle of clear, you know, glass of clear water, take an ink dropper with a drop of ink, drop it in, and just watch. It's truly amazing because, you know, you get like this um, vortex smoke ring, but then it breaks up into smaller vortex smoke rings and smaller still until you can't see anything anymore. So it's a beautiful example of, of like the, you know, cascade that happens in uh, homogeneous turbulence. Okay. Enough philosophy, let's now solve this problem because it's a very simple but also very beautiful solution. And I'm going to look at just the simplest case of constant kernel aggregation. So let me write down the rate equations that describe CK dot with constant kernel aggregation with steady input of monomers. So hopefully this will be a lot less intimidating. So um, what we have here then is summation CI, CJ, Again, sum prime because i plus j has to add up to k, so that's the gain term. There's a loss term, minus 2 ck, sum ci, and so I, you know, last lecture I called it two different things. I either called it the zeroth moment of the cluster size distribution, or I called it um, capital N. Uh, I don't know, I'll call it capital N today. And there's one more term because I'm feeding in monomers at a fixed rate. So there's a delta K1. And so these are my master equations that I want to solve. So how do we go about solving this infinite system of equations? Does somebody want to help me what technique I ought to use? What do I love? Generating functions, absolutely. You solve it by the generating function technique. So we're going to take this system of equations, multiply each one by z to the power k, sum over all k, and you'll see magic comes out because it becomes trivial. So on the left-hand side, we have g dot. The first term, we have ci, cj, zk, but k is equal to i plus j, so this is zi, zj. So ci, zi is a generating function. cj, zj is another generating function, so this is g squared. Then I have minus 2, CK, ZK, so that's G. And N is just the generating function with Z set equal to 1. So let's call that G. So I'm sorry that my notation is like sort of jumping around a bit, but I used this last time. And then I have, well, the delta function, you know, there's only the one term, so there's just Z. 
And now, to simplify matters, let's look at the steady state. So in the steady state, we'll set the left-hand side equal to zero. So we have zero equals g squared minus 2g g1 plus z. We're not quite done because what is g1? Well, the way we figure out what g1 is, as we now plug in, um, take um, uh, z equals 1. So when we take z equals 1, we get g1 squared minus 2g1 squared. So that's minus g1 squared plus 1 is equal to 0. So g1 is just equal to 1. So that makes life pretty simple. So I finally have g squared minus 2g plus z is equal to 0. So I think I can solve this equation. And we get g of z in the steady state is equal to uh, minus b. So it's minus 1 uh, plus or minus uh, 1 minus 4z. Plus 1. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and now there's two possibilities for the solution. And which sign should we take? And the way do we decide how, which sign to take is let's look at the limit when z is equal to 0. So when z is equal to 0, the generating function is just 0. So I plug in z. And by the way, um, there's no 4. Yes. So if I plug in z equals 0, one term gives me 2, the other term gives me 0. So I better take the one that gives me 0. So the right solution is just minus. So we now have the generating function. And as hopefully you appreciate, the generating function encapsulates or encodes all the cluster distribution um, in a single simple formula. So all we have to do is expand this in a power series in Z and see what comes out. Now it turns out there's very beautiful theorems about how you extract the asymptotics from the form of the generating function, but I'm just going to be pedestrian, but I want to be pedestrian because I want to show you kind of a very nice way of, of doing the expansion that gives you the exact answer with the, or the asymptotic answer with the minimum amount of work. So let's look at the square root of 1 minus z. And let me write it the following way, 1. And let me, if, you, if I may, let me write this as plus minus z. So I have 1 plus 1, plus 1 half times minus z, plus 1 half minus 1 half, minus z squared over 2, plus 1 half, minus 1 half, minus 3 halves, minus z cubed over 3 factorial, dot, dot, dot. The square outside which bracket? Oh. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> minus z squared over 2. Okay. Um, so anyways, first point to notice is that every single term comes with a minus sign. So that's just something simple. Uh, so let me write this as 1 plus, so I have 1 half z. I'm sorry. It all comes with a minus sign. Minus 1 half, 1 half uh, uh, z squared over 2. Uh, then I have minus 1 half, 1 half, 3 halves z squared over 3 factorial. Uh, and let me write one more term. Minus 1 half, 1 half, 3 halves, 5 halves, z fourth over 4 factorial. This is a little bit, you know, pedestrian. But anyways, so uh, what we want, though, is we want to take this square root, take the minus of it, add 1. When we take the minus and add 1, we get rid of the 1, and then all these become the plus sign. And so ck is nothing more than the coefficient of uh, an arbitrary term in the series. And so the coefficient of zk, this is equal to, um, so we have 1 over k factorial. Then we have a product. You know, so here is k factorial. And then we have a product that goes up to, so here we had 4. So this is nothing more than, um, uh, uh, what do I want to say? It's, it's 1 half, 3 halves. Uh, and that's up to k minus 3 halves. So that's everything here. 
And then there's one extra one half hanging out of the front. So divided by one half, divided by two. Now, when you're dealing with factorials, this is the absolute worst way to write these sorts of products. The right way to write these products is in terms of the gamma function. And so the gamma function, let me just remind you, gamma of k, uh, or let me write it. I always get this, I always get myself messed up here. So k factorial is equal to gamma of k minus 1. And it's nice to use the gamma function because there's asymptotics, you can differentiate it, you can play with it. And so what you get when you use this fact is there is a term here. So there's a one half, then there's gamma of k. Oh, did I, did I mess this up? I, I, it's plus one. Ah. Yes. That's right, gamma of k plus 1. That's one of the things Euler did to like drive me crazy, was he defined it with like the plus 1 rather than just... Okay, so there's gamma of k plus 1. Now let's look at the, th this thing. Some of you who may have encountered this before might say, well, it's like a double factorial because it's like the terms are separated by 2. That's the wrong way to do it. It's better to write this as a product of gamma functions. So the gamma function is defined just as a product. Uh, it's defined recursively. And when it's an integer value, the product ends at a finite value. But when uh, it's non-integer value, the product uh, of the gamma function of a non-integer value goes on forever. So this is nothing more than, let me just write the answer and then let me explain it. Uh, so this is nothing more than gamma of k minus 1 half divided by gamma of 1 half. So the gamma of k minus 1 half generates a product that starts at k minus 3 halves, k minus 5 halves, dot, 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 all the way down to minus infinity. But the gamma of 1 half starts with minus a half, minus 3 halves, so it cancels the infinite series of terms. And now um, there's a little bit of black magic, which, you know, I, I urge you to try it yourself. Just use Sterling's approximation to then evaluate this ratio of gamma functions. Gamma of 1 half is square root of pi. So this turns it... Yeah, so asymptotically, this is 1 over 4 pi square root, and this is the ratio of gamma of k plus a divided by k plus b is nothing more than k to the a minus b. So this is k to the minus 3 halves. So that's it. That's the solution of uh, constant kernel aggregation with a steady input of monomers. Yes? Yeah, I mean, there, strangely enough, there's some very... Uh, beautiful and surprising connections between like random walks and their generating functions and that of the of this um, yeah so it looks very much like the generating function of a 1d random walk and there's other there's other coincidences like that that I'll, I'll mention later on any other questions okay so this concludes my very brief introduction or summary introduction slash summary to aggregation kinetics. I hope I've given you a sense that aggregation is a prototypical non-equilibrium process that you can really um, hammer on to get exact solutions and scaling solutions and get a lot of insight about how non-equilibrium processes actually manifest themselves mathematically. So as I mentioned at the beginning is that I really want to focus on explicit solutions of the simplest possible systems. So conceptually, everything I'm doing I think is fairly simple. Some of the mathematical detail is maybe a little bit unfamiliar, but you know, when you get familiar, then it's all, it's all very straightforward. There's nothing, there's no, there's very little black magic here except for maybe the Lagrange inversion formula. So uh, that ends sort of uh, chapter one. And the second uh, dis uh, chapter I want to discuss is irreversible. So what do I mean by irreversible adsorption? So imagine that you have some kind of a substrate like this, and there are molecules floating around in the air above it. And when these molecules hit the surface, it goes here and it sticks and it's stuck there forever. So this might be what happens when you put paint on a wall or polymers absorbing at a surface or various sorts of processes at the surface of cells where various uh, molecules absorb on receptors and stay there for a time scale which is long compared to any other time scale on the problem. And we want to understand the kinetics of this adsorption process. And in particular, what I'm interested in is suppose that, you know, more and more molecules start landing on the surface 
And, you know, there'll be some regions where something like this, where there's just not enough room for another molecule to come here. So if molecules are absorbing in a random fashion, it's not a very efficient process because the surface will get gummed up because there'll be places where if I was just a little bit more kind or if nature was a little bit more kind, you would have plenty of space to park more cars, for example. You know, think about car parking with, you know, when you have some idiot who parks in a spot that could accommodate three cars and he parks in the middle and then nobody else can park anymore. So that's kind of the situation you want to understand is this frustration as the uh, substrate gets more full, what is the uh, uh, coverage? And so I want to present to you, again, I want to stay mostly in the world of exactly soluble models. And the only case that is exactly soluble is one dimension. But even in one dimension, the system is so rich, and you'll see that you, ha you can generate very beautiful solutions of how a one-dimensional surface will fill up. So let's focus, first of all, in 1D. And so what I have in mind here is here's my one-dimensional substrate. It looks something like this. Here are the adsorption sites. And when a particle comes in, it sort of fills this and stays there forever. So, I mean, so the picture I've drawn here is monomer adsorption. And the basic thing we want to compute is rho of t. What is the density or what is the coverage as a function of time? Well, for monomer adsorption, there's almost nothing to do because the problem is trivial. Namely, uh, if I look at V, which is equal to 1 minus rho, the vacancy density, so this is vacancy density. Then the equation, the rate equation for V is V dot is equal to minus V. You know, any, any site that's vacant can get filled. And so the rate at which vacancies disappear is proportional to the density of vacancies. So this gives me V is equal to, and if my initial condition is a system starts out empty, then I just have equals to e to the minus t, and that means that rho infinity is equal to 1. So it's sort of obvious. It fills up. Now let me make a little twist to the problem that makes this problem suddenly very different in character and very beautiful, and that is the problem of deposition, not of monomers, but deposition of dimers. So let's now look at dimer absorption. So my molecules are something that looks like a dumbbell, something like this. And again, on my surface, so this dimer can come in and it lands here, for example. So here is a, maybe I should do this with a different color. So here is an absorbed dimer. And maybe another dimer comes and uh, fills over here. And then if you are a dimer floating above here, you're sitting above here, you say, God damn it, this guy's right in the way. You know, if he had only moved over one, I would have had a space, but I have no space. And so clearly, as you fill and fill and fill, there'll be a final state reached where there's gaps of size one only. And then you can ask, well, what is rho infinity? It's obviously less than one, and what is that number? And so um, in 1939, Paul Flory, who was a Nobel Prize winning polymer chemist, solved this problem exactly using combinatoric techniques. And the reason why, you know, in India, it might be something that one would appreciate is that when I first saw this paper, I thought, oh, you know, it should have been something Ramanujan wrote because it was just exactly Ramanujan-esque in his techniques. So it turns out that Paul Flory computed this density and it's 1 minus e to the minus 2. It's a really beautiful, cute number. And, you know, go take a look at his paper in 1939 Journal of Chemical Physics. It's one of those things that you scratch your head and, you know, you work through it for like a week and you think, boy, if I was 10 times smarter than I was, maybe I could have done this. But I can't do it. But part of the reason I want to sh I'm giving you this example is, again, I want to show the power of non-equilibrium perspective, because as we're going to do now, we're going to solve this problem using non-equilibrium techniques. And as you'll see, the solution is much simpler in the non-equilibrium situation. And in fact, in addition to getting the coverage at the infinite time, we get the coverage at all times.
So that's the next thing I want to show. One is what I might call the vacancy density. And this I'll define as in the following way. That's a probability that the following configuration exists. An occupied site, M empty sites, so here is M of these guys, and then another occupied site. So let me define this thing to be V sub M. So this is the density of vacancies of size M. That seems to be a natural way that we could try and describe how the surface evolves, because we could write down a master equation for how this vacancy density might evolve. It turns out there's another uh, degree of freedom that we can define. Actually, there's two more, but I'll only define one more. Because as I'm going to show you, while this might seem very natural as a way of defining the surface, it turns out to be not very good, because it ends up if you write down the master equation for this, which we're going to do momentarily, it's not easily soluble. Whereas the master equation for another degree of freedom is much easier to solve. So I'm going to call this the empty interval density. And so this is the probability that I have the following configuration. M empty sites, and I don't care what's outside. So this I'll define to be E sub M. So you should think of yourself as a mule who's got blinders on, and the blinders like extend this way, and I can see like four people in a row. So I see you four people there, but I don't see what's outside. So I don't know if there's someone sitting in that seat or not, or whether there's an aisle there. All I see is the four of you. And it turns out that this uh, empty interval probability is much easier to actually deal with in studying uh, dimer absorption. So let's write down the master equations for these two densities, and we'll only solve one of them because one of them I don't know how to solve easily, whereas the other one is, is solvable by elementary techniques. And again, what I'm trying to show is that, you know, when you write some, when you have a simple enough state space, you can write down the master equations. There you have to be able to effectively have the perspective of an accountant, just keep track of everything. And then, you know, many of these equations in the one dimensional setting, and this is another one dimensional setting are solvable by classical mathematical techniques. So the master equations. So let's look at the, first of all, the equation for V sub M, because we don't know which one is going to be better or worse. I'm, I'm kind of intimating that one is better. But let's write down the equation for V sub M. So V sub M dot, how does this change with time? Well, there's two ways that a, a, it can change. If I take a particular empty, you know, vacancy, uh, a vacancy system, if I can drop a dimer in the, in the middle of the vacancy, I can kill it. So there's a loss term, and the loss term is going to be equal to minus m minus 1 vm. Because if you have, like, say, a vacancy of 17 sites and I have a dimer, I can put the head of the dimer in one of 16 positions, and any one of those will kill the dimer, and so there's m minus way to kill a vacancy of size m. But then uh, there is a gain term, because if I have a vacancy of a, a large size and I drop a dimer somewhere in the middle, then I fragment this vacancy into two smaller vacancies, and so I create two smaller vacancies. And so there will be a gain term, because, um, so let me write it down and then explain it. So it's a summation um, uh, 2 to infinity v, so this is k equals uh, 2 to infinity uh, v k uh, v m plus k. So the point here is that um, if I have a very large vacancy, then um, as long as it's of size twice, two sides bigger than the, what I want to create, then when I drop like a, a, a dimer in between, I then will, uh, if I drop it, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of balling up in my words here, but let me maybe draw a picture. So here's like my vacancy. And suppose this is the size that I want to generate. I want to look at the change in, in number of vacancies of, so, whoop, let's do it this way. I want to make and, and generate a vacancy of size um, five. So, uh, you know, so here this is occupied and here this is occupied. So to generate a vacancy of size five, 
if I drop my dimer here, right here, then I create like a vacancy of size one and a vacancy of size five. On the other hand, if I drop this, you know, there's, I could have dropped it over here, or I could have dropped it over here. And those two independent ways of creating a vacancy of size five. So in a vacancy which is anywhere between two larger to any size larger, I create um, a vacancy. So this is, uh, you know, the loss of vacancies and creation of vacancies by fragmentation. There's only one problem with this equation, which is that as a function of m, it's a non-local equation because there's, the index here can be anything. Let's look at the same equation for the empty interval probabilities, E sub m. And this turns out to be much simpler, and I'm going to solve this one. But let's first of all write the equation, so E sub m dot. So how do I um, lose an empty interval? Well, there's turns out to be the same way as before, m minus 1, E sub m. So again, if I have an interval of size m, here it is of size 4, then I can put a dimer here, here, or here in three different places, m minus one places, and kill that empty interval. But a crucial difference here, and in fact, I think I learned this trick actually from John Carty about 35 years ago because he it turned me on to a paper about Aerosmith and Essam that you might remember, but it's, it's something th there that uh, is where this, this comes from. But anyways, the point is that since we don't care what's on the outside, if, you know, there could be, there could be, there could be part, there could be a dimer deposited here or it could be a vacancy. So the point is that there's no way that you ever create a vacancy of, you know, you never create vacancies of a given size. I mean, or empty intervals of a given size. You can only lose them because you have blinders on and all you care about is this world of four sites. And, you know, all that can happen when you look at those four sites is that if all these seats are empty, all that can happen is that they're going to get filled, and so you're only losing empty intervals. So there's, one, there's a term here which is a loss term, not a, a gain term, but it's two, twice um, E M plus 1. And so what this corresponds to is that I have, say, my empty interval of size 4 that I want to create. Um, there is, and I'm not quite sure how to draw the picture, but if I had an empty interval of size 5 and I dropped a car here, then I kill an empty interval of size um, four, and I could have dropped it on one side or the other side, and that's why this is a factor of two. So this is the master equation that describes the empty interval probabilities, and it has the advantage that it's local in M because it involves M and M plus one. And as you're going to see, it's actually pretty easily soluble. So, you know, once again, when you're first exposed to the master equations with these different, like, many-body systems, you should play on your own and, like, actually enumerate some of the small, low-order configurations and verify for yourself that all of these, what I'm telling you, is actually correct. I mean, it is correct, but, um, you know, it, it takes a while, of, it takes some staring and rewriting and playing with it to really convince yourself that it, that it is correct. Anyways, let's solve this equation, because it turns out that the solution, yeah, question. That's right, there's no gain term. Again, you know, you have to think, you have blinders on. All you can see is like four, four seats here. And if the seats are empty and now students start coming into the class, all that can happen is that these four seats will get filled and the number of empty intervals can only decrease. There's no way that I can start with a region of four seats and have a student in one of them and then somehow by more absorption have the number of empty intervals increase. So that's what makes this actually a simpler problem to solve. Okay. All right, so let's solve this equation. Um, first thing to notice is that if I didn't have this term, we know how to solve this. This is just exponential. You know, e to the minus m minus 1t. But this is like kind of playing the role of an inhomogeneous term, and we can use, it, we can use the homogeneous solution as an integrating factor. And so let's try the following solution. Um, e m is equal to some phi of t e to the minus m minus 1 t. So it's just like what you learn in elementary differential, differential equations and probably forget, which is that when you have uh, an equation of this type, uh, you can use the homogeneous solution as an integrating factor. So let's try that and plug it into the equation and see what comes out. So on the left-hand side, we have em dot, so that's going to be phi dot e to the minus m 
minus 1t. And then I have minus, so I want to differentiate this guy. So I have minus m minus 1 phi e to the minus m minus 1t. And on the right-hand side, we have um, minus m minus 1. And phi was, I mean, e was phi e to the minus m minus 1t. And then I have uh, minus 2 e m plus 1. So it's 2 phi e to the minus m t. So nicely enough, these go away. And then I can write a simple equation for phi dot. So phi dot is equal to, and now uh, the m here cancels that m. And then this is e to the plus t. I put it on that side, so it's e to the minus t. So it's minus 2 uh, e to the minus t e to the minus t phi. And now this is just uh, sophomore differential equations. Um, so I can write this as log phi dot is equal to e to the minus, minus 2 e to the minus t. And so we'll get um, log of phi of t divided by phi of 0 is equal to the integral. Uh, 0 up to t um, minus 2 e to the minus t dt. This is the dangerous part of the calculation because I always get the sign wrong. So please tell me if I'm doing the sign incorrectly. Um, so, uh, so we'll have minus 2 e to the minus t. So it becomes a plus sign. And then I, so it's e to the minus t minus 1. I hope that's correct. And so finally, I'm going to get phi of t is equal to phi at t equals 0. But what is phi at t equals 0? So at t equals 0, the interface is empty. And so all of these probabilities are 1. So at t equals 0, all the EMs are 1. So all, the, all phi, is, phi is 1. So we don't need phi, we, phi at t equals 0 is 1. And so we're going to get exp of 2 e to the minus t minus 1. So um, that's that. And now we're almost done because now we want to compute the coverage. And so what is the coverage? Rho of t. And I argued that rho of t is nothing more than 1 minus e1 of t. e1 is the probability that an empty interval of size 1. 1 minus that is the probability that this inter interval of size 1 is actually occupied. And e1 you see that this goes away, and so e1 is nothing more than phi, and so this is just 1 minus e to the mi um, e to the 2 e to the minus t minus 1. So that's the answer, rho of t. Very pretty looking solution, and now we can take the limit, t going to infinity. And what we get is rho infinity is equal to 1, when t goes to infinity, oh, yeah, the 2 is on the outside. Thank you. Right. And so the e to the t goes away. Uh, and then we have e to the minus 2. 1 minus e to the minus 2. Isn't that cool? Very, it's, very, it's a very pleasing calculation. I enjoy it every time I play with these sorts of things. Um, the last thing that we can do with this is um, we can ask, like, how does the coverage approach its final coverage? We can ask, what is, I guess I'll put it here, we can also ask, what is rho infinity minus rho of t? How does that approach zero as t goes to infinity? And so rho infinity minus rho of t, so that will be um, 1 minus e to the minus 2, that's rho infinity, minus rho of t, which is 1 minus e to the minus e to the 2 e to the minus t minus 1. So this cancels, this cancels. We're going to have e to the minus 2 as a common factor. And then I'm going to have um, e to the 2 e to the minus t minus 1. 
And for large time, I can expand this in a Taylor series. And so the first term cancels, and the next term is just 2e to the minus t. So this is asymptotically like 2, e to the minus 2, e to the minus t. So this is just some overall amplitude. And so we see that there's exponential approach to the final state. So that is uh, dimer absorption. Any questions? So uh, one can play the same game. You could say, well, what about trimers? What about formers? What about camers? All of these can be solved. Um, and, you know, I invite you to try it as a, as a nice exercise to just test your understanding because it's, it's just fun to play with these things. Um, but what I want to do in my remaining time is why don't I cut to the chase and say, well, if we're going to study 2, 3, 4, 17, 18, 19, why don't we just do arbitrary size? Why don't we do continuous size cards? So um, the next thing I want to study, and the reason I want to study it is because it's similar mathematics, a little bit more complicated, but instead of having an exponential approach to the final state, there is a power law approach to the final state, and it's worth uh, emphasizing this. So let's now look at card deposition. So this you can think of as like a dystopian version of New York City where people are desperate to look for a parking spot, but once you leave your car at a parking spot, you never, ever leave it. I mean, you, you know, you never, it never leaves the parking spot. So you can ask, like, what happens if, you know, it, it's, you take away all the parking meters in New York City, people can park wherever the hell they want on, along a one, uh, you know, one-dimensional uh, street, and so cars fill up, and, you know, it's not going to fill up completely. What is the, cover, what is the final coverage, and um, how quickly does it approach at final coverage? So that's what I want to investigate now. So now, instead of using E sub M, let me look at E X T. So this is going to be the density of empty space of length X. And so, in an almost you know, exact uh, analogy with the master equations that I wrote for dimer deposition, we want to write equations for this um, uh, empty space uh, uh, density. So now, because we have two variables, we should write an equation for d, e, x, t, d, t. And hopefully it's going to look kind of familiar because it's almost the same equations as before. So um, one way that we, this, and in fact, if I may, let me just put this lower down because there's two, you'll see in a moment that there's two possibilities that I have to take care of. So de x t equals, so let's put big brackets here. Turns out that one has to pay attention to whether x is bigger than one so I'm imagining that my car, I, sh I should have said this at the outset, my cars are of length one. Car deposition, length one. And so for x less than one, there's a slightly different form. So for x larger than one, well, it's, then it's just like we had for the uh, master equation for the dimer deposition. There'll be a term that looks like x minus one e x t. And if we look at this thing pictorially, so here we have um, a parking space of length x, and there's a car of length 1. And so this car, the front of the car, the nose of the car could be anywhere between 0 and x minus 1, and it still fits in the parking spot. That's why there's an amplitude x minus 1. But then there is, whoops, uh, it's all lost terms. There's another term here, because I have a parking space of size x, and a car noses in either on one side or the other side and removes an interval of size x. But when, in order to do this, the, car ha the actual interval has to be longer than x. It has to be between x and x plus 1. So there has to be an integral from x to x plus 1. We want to have an interval of size, and then there's a 2 because there's two ways that the car can nose in. And then there's 2 e, y, t. Why? 
And so that describes what happens for uh, x bigger than one. You got, you have a question? No, okay. No, no, because the point is that the car could be, you know, the, the car could be anywhere with, it could be just inside with the tail just peeking out over the edge of the interval, or it could be all the way to here with the nose just barely touching the interval. So when this is length one, this is length x, so it, the interval has to be up to size x plus one. Um, for x less than one, well, actually, let me write the equation, and, and then I'll, I'll sort of wave my hands why it's this form. I'll write it, it's one minus x e one t minus two integral from one to x plus one e y t d y. And the way that you can see why it has to have this form is that when the size of the interval is less than one, effectively you're exchanging the role of the car in the parking spot. And so all you have to do to go from these equations to this equation is just replace x by, you know, replace one by, you know, x by one and vice versa. And so um, that's how you get this, the second equation. Okay, so now we have, want to solve this equation by, um, exactly the same method as before. And here I might skip a couple of steps because it's exactly the same kind of mathematics, but you know, just I might, I might get lazy in trying to work every step. So so maybe somebody wants to help me. What is the form of the solution? So let me write EXT. I just erased something on this blackboard that actually was the same form. I mean, how should I write the form of this solution? Shouldn't I write it with some exponential prefactor in front? And what's the exponential prefactor? Right, there's like an x minus one. So what's the, pre what's the exponential prefactor? Somebody shout it out. What? A student, a student should shout it out, yeah. Excellent. Minus x minus 1 t times phi of t. Just the same as before. What? Um, well, let, let's, just, let's just worry about x bigger than 1 for the moment, and we'll see what happens. Okay, so when we do that, and so now allow me the luxury of skipping a few steps here because um, you, you see that it's all the way on the other side of the blackboard. Um, and so when I differentiate this guy, there's a term which will bring down the x minus 1, which cancels this guy. And so all I'm left with then will be, um, when I differentiate the phi, so it'll be x minus 1 t phi dot, so that's on the left-hand side and the right-hand side is just the uh, second term is all that matters. So it's going to be 2, and there's phi of t, and then I have the integral from x to x plus 1, and then I have e y t, so it's e to the minus y t dt. And again, this is the part that I really, I, I'm, I'm terrible at, so watch out because maybe I'm going to screw it up. What? Minus. No, sorry. The e by dt. E, no, this is this is fine. And oh, but a minus sign here. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so um, we have minus two phi, and so I'm going to have when I integrate this thing. So when I, and this is dy. Whoops, dy. Dyslexia is now setting in. Okay, so when I uh, integrate this, there's a 1 over t, so there's a 2 phi over t. And then I have, um, when I diff integrate this guy, the minus conspires, conspires with this to make it a plus sign. And then I have e to the minus x plus 1 t minus e to the minus x t. And on the left-hand side, I have this guy. And so um, let me now cancel out at e to the minus x t. And... Um, Here's where the chance of me getting it right are kind of uncertain. So we're going to get phi dot is equal to, so the x cancels, 
the x cancels. This is an e to the plus t. I bring it down to the other side and it becomes e to the minus t. Uh, plus t. There, I, 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 see a, I, I see a mistake here, which does, if anyone sees it, what? Integrand. It's e y ah. Thank you, thank you. That saves a lot of trouble. E to the minus y one t dy. Okay, thank you. And so this becomes x t, and this becomes. Sorry, I told you this is the part that I, I'm, I'm really bad at. X minus one t. Okay, so the x cancels, and then I have here e to the plus t, so it becomes an e to the minus t. So I'm going to get phi dot is equal to two phi over t, and so it looks like it's e to the minus t minus 1. And I'll write this as minus 2 phi over t, uh, 1 minus e to the minus t. And now I integrate this thing, and so I'm going to get phi of t, and again, phi of 0 is equal to 1, so it's going to be exponential because this is, when I take phi, phi dot over phi, that's the differential of the logarithm, so it's exponential, and then I have here integral um, 0 up to t, uh, 2 phi over u, 1 minus e to the minus u, the u. So that's the answer for phi. We're almost done, and we have plenty of time. Um, we want to find the coverage. So what is the coverage? So similar to what I just erased here, the coverage is 1 minus the density of the minimal size interval, and the minimal size interval is intervals of size 0. So the coverage, rho of t, is equal to 1 minus e of 0 t. And now I look at the equation for um, here, and uh, if I plug in x equals 0, so if I look at intervals of size 0, when I plug in x equals 0, this term goes away. And dE0 by dt is equal to 1 minus, is equal to minus E1. So notice that then dE0 by dt is equal to, and what did I just say, minus E1. So um, E0 of t minus E0 of t equals 0, maybe I'll put an argument here, t equals 0, is equal to minus the integral of E1 of t dt from 0 up to t. But the phi should not be there in the exponential. You're absolutely correct. Everything else is fine. Thank you. Thanks for setting me straight. Uh, anyways, but E is 1 minus rho, so this equation just becomes, um, uh, so this is 1 minus E, sorry, this is 1 minus rho of T, that's what this guy is, minus 1 minus rho at T equals 0, is equal to the same integral, minus E1 of T dt. Um, so the ones cancel. Um, Rho at t equals zero, there's nothing, so that's also zero. And so finally, I have my result. Rho of t is equal to the integral from zero up to t, e1 of t dt. And now, notice again, by the way I've constructed things, that e of one is just nothing more than phi. So it's the same as the integral of phi. And so I finally have my coverage 0 to t, and then I want to integrate this phi. So it's going to be exp e, e, e of uh, integral from, say, 0 to v, 2 over u, 1 minus e to the minus u du dv. So that's my answer. 
it looks a little bit funky because everything is up in the exponential. It's a little bit hard to see what's going on. But let me just say that as t goes to infinity, so rho of t going to infinity, this integral converges, and it converges to a finite number known as the Renyi constant, which is 0.747 dot, dot, dot. And so this problem was first solved by Renyi in 1950, the same Renyi of the erdos renyi random graph. He also studied a variety of beautiful combinatoric problems, and this was one of them. The last thing that I want to present here is what is the approach to the final state? So what is, again, rho infinity minus rho of t? Well, rho infinity is just the integral to infinity. We subtract the integral from 0 to t, and so this thing is nothing more than the integral from t to infinity, with that same funky integrand, exp, of minus integral from 0 to v, 2 over u, 1 minus e to the minus u du, dv. And we're interested in limit where t is large. And so when t is large, that means that the upper limit of this integration is very large. And now if you stare at this thing, the leading behavior of this is 2 over u. And when I integrate e to the, you know, 2 over u, that gives me 2 log u, and I exponentiate it, and I get 1 over u squared, or 1 over v squared. So it turns out that this integral asymptotically is 2 log u uh, plus the Euler constant, 0.577, whatever it is. And so when you then, uh, you know, when you, uh, and so when, when you, uh, sorry, 2 log v. So then it's v to the minus 2 dv, which is 1 over, which gives you 1 over time. So this thing asymptotically goes like e, e to the minus 2 gamma over t. So that's the final result, is that the approach to the uh, final state, instead of being exponential when you had discrete objects which are being deposited, actually decays as 1 over t. So let me mention one last thing about this car parking problem, which I will not discuss here, but it's just a very beautiful thing to think about, which is that in a real city, people don't abandon their cars forever. I mean, people come and, you know, they find a good parking spot, but every once in a while they've got to, like, leave the parking spot because someone else, they've got to go to work or visit somebody. So a more realistic situation is when cars both park and unpark. And uh, then there will be a steady state which is achieved. And if we live in big cities, we know that the density of open spaces is actually very, very small. But sometimes you'll see a situation where some idiot, again, has parked his uh, car like in the middle of a car par parking spot so that if, when he leaves, two cars can fit in. So if you think of the limit where cars park very quickly, like New York City, everybody's you know, driving around the block looking for a parking spot. If a parking spot becomes available, it's like the efficient market hypothesis, immediately a car fills it up. But every once in a while, some idiot leaves a parking spot where he had lots of space on either side, but then two cars can fill up. And this collective behavior continues ad infinitum, and so in fact, one can show that the approach to the steady state, in fact, is inverse logarithm law. And the reason I mention this is this inverse logarithm law appears in many contexts and in specifically for granular compaction. So one can use the kind of mathematics to start understanding some features about granular compaction. So I just wanted to mention it as kind of a, you know, food for thought. Now I've got 10 minutes left and I've spent all this time discussing adsorption in one dimension. You might ask, well, what about adsorption in higher dimensions? What, do we, what should we do there? That's a more realistic case. I mean, there's not that many Absorption processes in one dimension, unless you put hairspray on your hair, which is a one-dimensional absorption problem, but 2D might be more physically relevant. So let's now look at general dimension. And here, there's nothing to say. There's no exact solution. But what we can do is that we can write an approximate solution. And so let me show you an approximate asymptotic solution this is an argument that I think was made by Pomo and Swenson you know, independently and roughly simultaneously in the late 70s, but this is the state of the art. And as you're going to see, the state of the art is very crude, but it's clearly the right state of the art. 
and um, is you know, still open to understand really what happens in detail in higher dimensions. So let me imagine that my particles are circles, and they're coming down on a two-dimensional substrate. And let's study what is the approach to the final coverage in two dimensions. So clearly there'll be a jamming coverage, and lots of people have studied this numerically, but then how, does it how do you approach the jamming coverage is kind of the basic uh, behavior that we're interested in. So let's look when, as T is getting very large, what our, inter our surface is going to look like. So we put down our first circle, it can land anywhere, no problem. But notice that when a circle lands like this, there is an exclusion zone. Maybe I should do this in a different color. Because if the, if the center of a circle lands here, then it's going to overlap with this guy. So this exclusion zone says this is the closest that a next particle can actually land. And so maybe my next particle lands here, and it does that. So the exclusion zone, you know, you can overlap a particle with an, boy, that's a different size. I want that to be mono-sized. Um, a particle can overlap an exclusion zone, but two particles can't overlap. So as I continue adding particles, something like this happens. And now, even though there's like space here, it's not big enough to actually uh, accommodate another particle. So what happens in the long time limit is that there's these sorts of exclusion zones. And so I'm not much of an artist here, but let me attempt to draw some kind of a weird shaped exclusion zone. There is this exclusion zone here, which so the way that I've drawn it right now is that if this is outside of the exclusion zones of any other particle, I could land one more particle and it would just barely fit inside of here. But then it would, the exclusion zone completely disappears. So let me define C, L, T as the density of available areas. And these areas are typically like triangulated shapes or trapezoidal shapes um, of length scale L. So here again, we're being very rough because it's clear that there's lots of different shapes and I'm not worrying about details of the shape degrees of freedom. I'm just saying that for roughly isotropic objects, the possible landing zones are roughly isotropic objects. They'll have a one characteristic size scale here, a scale L. And so what I want to ask is how dc by dt, how does the, the density of these like available zones, how that decreases as a function of time? And so what I would say is that the rate at which a uh, guy disappears, if it has length scale L, it has area L squared. And so the rate at which this disappears is proportional to its area. So it's minus L squared times the dens density of zones of this characteristic size. And so from this, we'll get that C asymptotically goes like E to the minus L squared T. And you know, this is, this is, there's almost nothing to this argument, but I mean, it's like, you know, again, it was very beautiful um, insight to develop this argument, but mathematically, there's almost nothing more to do because now what we want to ask is how the density changes as a function of time. So how does the density change? And so what I would say is that per unit, per unit time, it's the integral over all of these exclusion zones. So it's integral from zero to uh, infinity. Um, L squared, e to the minus L squared t dl. So this is the rate at which the surface coverage increases because I have, this is the density of like, I keep, I'm sorry, I'm using incorrectly the word exclusion zone. What I mean is available zone. So here's the density of available zones. Here's the area of the available zones. And so the density increases uh, in this way. And now how do we evaluate this integral? The simplest way to evaluate this integral is by scaling. You see that there's a natural variable combination here, L squared T. So let me put a T here, so it's T L squared. Let me put a root T here, and then I have to divide by T to the 3 halves so that I haven't done any damage to this integral. And then you see that this integral is like the integral of X, E to the minus X, D, 
root x, or maybe I should write this as x squared e to the minus x squared dx. So it's a number of order one. And so this scale says t to the minus three halves. And so finally, rho infinity minus rho, you obtain just by integrating this thing, and this is proportional to one over t to the one half. This is it. This is the state of the art of understanding uh, irreversible absorption in higher dimensions. Um, one thing you could generalize is I drew this picture for two dimensions. You could ask, well, what happens in d dimensions? Let's do that because I've got three minutes left to go. So let's do it in d dimensions. So clearly this becomes a d over here. And so this becomes l to the d. Here I have l to the d l to the d, uh, so this is root instead of, so this is going to be t to the 1 over d. And so what we're going to get here in the end is this scales as 1 over t to the d plus 1. Uh, did I do, I, let's see, what did I do here? Ah. Danger of trying to do something in three minutes really quickly. T, L to the D, L to the D. Uh, and so, I'm sorry, so I multiply by T. Yeah, so it's T to the one over T to the one plus one over D. And finally here, this be T to the one over D. So that is, um, you know, isotropic particle deposition in D dimensions. So I've, I'm, I'm at the end of my story now. I've now presented two chapters on aggregation kinetics, absorption kinetics. Uh, tomorrow's lecture is going to be a little bit of a complement to uh, Uri's lecture this morning. I will talk about coarsening dynamics. Uh, he was mainly interested in, at the critical point. I'm going to look at zero temperature coarsening dynamics because I feel that that's a very, again, simple paradigmatic that you can solve some things explicitly. And so that'll be the focus of tomorrow's lecture. Well, it depends, on what kind of, it depends on what kind of model you're dealing with. If you're simulating a discrete model, you'll see exponential approach. If you have particles that are depositing in the continuum, then you'll see power law approach. Well, I mean, you can think of like polymer dynamics where you have like sort of specific uh, painting, painting a wall. You know, you have latex particles that deposit, so yeah. Any other questions?